Good evening on this Saturday night, wherever you may be, and welcome to this time of evening prayer together, coming your way from London, Ontario, Canada. This is the 29th of May, the month of May, rapidly drawing to a to a close, and it is the last day in our Pentecost week. Tomorrow will be the Feast of the Holy Trinity. As we gather together on this day, we want to take a moment to take stock of the of the days that are being observed before turning to our prayers, uh, looking at how these days affect us in body, mind, and spirit. Today is Biscuit Day, and that term biscuit is more in the sense of the British usage of the word biscuit than in the North American usage. Uh, that is to say, what we in North America would call cookies, the Brits call biscuits. And uh, biscuits were a health food rather than a snack until the 17th or 18th century when they began adding sweetening to it. Eating biscuits at sea remained popular well through the Middle Ages. In the 16th century, the Royal Navy provided its sailors with an allowance each day of a pound of sea biscuits and a gallon of beer. Yes, you heard that right, a gallon of beer, uh, to help them fight off the Spanish Armada. I, I, I would suggest that when we're wondering why is it this way, because the baking of these hard biscuits, uh, not sweet at all, uh, with, uh, with fruit in them and, and grain and then sources of protein, were a way of sustaining health. Uh, I think of granola bars, but think of them without all the sweetener that's put in them now. And so this is Biscuit Day, and I guess you could have a biscuit of some sort, either cookie style or uh, more the kind of dinner biscuits we now think of to help celebrate the day. But it is a day to think about nutrition and health that which is good for the body, which sustains and restores the body. Uh, also, about that, that we can think good thoughts about, and that that can lift our spirits. This is Mount Everest Day, because on this day, the 29th of May in, 19, in 1953, Nepalese Sherpa guide Tenzing Norgay and New Zealand mountaineer Edmund Hillary reached the summit of Mount Everest. So for us, this can also be a day to think of challenges, seeking higher and higher goals. When we're reading our psalm a little later in this worship service, we'll note that the, the psalm mentions Mount Hermon, uh, which is visible all the way from the Sea of Galilee, even though it's some 60 kilometers away. Uh, on a clear day, you can see the peaks of Mount Hermon which rises 2,814 meters, or if you'd prefer to say, 9,232 feet. Uh, while more traditionally the Transfiguration has been identified as occurring on Mount Tabor, uh, farther down, uh, many scholars wonder if it might not have been on the, on the peak of uh, Mount Hermon. Uh, for one reason, the, the Gospel account has Jesus and the disciples at Caesarea Philippi, Philippi, which was in the foothills of Mount Hermon, just before they went to the Mount of Transfiguration. They didn't leave a marker saying, we were here, uh, and they did not give the geographic coordinates. Uh, they didn't have their G GPS devices with them. But it is a chance to think of those peaks, both actual and spiritual, to challenge us in one way or another, and are striving always to reach greater and higher places in life. And last today, this is Learn About Composting Day. I considered setting up in our back garden, and you may have caught glimpses of the composter now and then in the background, but the sun is very bright there now, and I would be squinting like crazy Plus, some neighbor kids are out in the back having fun on their trampoline. Uh, so we've gathered here on the, uh, on the front deck with a birch tree behind us, a gentle breeze beside us, and a chance to gather together. Um, as we look 
at the peaks and the valleys of our lives. And now, turning to our prayers. O Lord, I call to you. Come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer be set forth in your sight as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. O gracious light, pure brightness of the ever-living Father in heaven, O Jesus Christ, holy and blessed, now as we come to the setting of the sun, and our eyes behold the vesper light, we sing your praises, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy at all times to be praised by happy voices, O Son of God, O giver of life, and to be glorified through all the worlds. Our psalm is Psalm 42. As the deer longs for the water brooks, so longs my soul for you, O God. My soul is a thirst for God, a thirst for the living God. When shall I come to appear before the presence of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while all day long they say to me, Where is your God now? I pour out my soul, and I think upon these things, how I went with a multitude, and led them into the house of God, with a voice of praise and thanksgiving, among those who keep holy day. Why are you so full of heaviness, O my soul? And why are you so disquieted within me? Put your trust in God, for I will yet give thanks to him, who is the help of my countenance and my God. My soul is heavy within me, Therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, and from the peak of Mizar, among the heights of Hermon. One deep calls to another, in the noise of your cataracts. All your rapids and floods have gone over me. The Lord grants his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night season his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to the God of my strength, why have you forgotten me? And why do I go so heavily while the enemy oppresses me? While my bones are being broken, my enemies mock me to my face. All day long they mock me and say to me, Where now is your God? Why are you so full of heaviness, O my soul? And why are you so disquieted within me? Put your trust in God, for I will yet give thanks to him who is a help of my countenance and my God. Traditionally, we have believed the Psalms to be written by King David at a time when he was a shepherd boy, and maybe later also in life as he reflected upon the ups and downs, the peaks and valleys of his own life. And he reflected on those times when he felt near to God, and those times when he felt away from God, looking toward Mount Hermon, a peak, and remembering those good times with God. He thought of those who had opposed him. He thought perhaps of battles in which he had been involved. He wondered why people would mock him and say, Where is your God? And so he says, he longs for God, like a deer longs for water. We have a hymn, uh, As Pants the Heart, H-A-R-T, As Pants the Heart for Living Streams, So Pants My Heart for Thee. Uh, he said, Put your trust in God, for I will yet give thanks to him, who is the help of my countenance and my God. So words of reassurance from King David in his times of difficulty. And now the collect with our psalm. Gracious God, in the night of distress, we forget the days of sun and joy. Even when we do not know your presence, preserve us from the dark torrent of despair. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we do turn now to our scripture reading, 
we've been reading this week and again next week we will be reading from uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul's second letter to the uh, Christian community in Corinth. Uh, tomorrow, being a Sunday, we will take a little time off uh, from our readings of 2 Corinthians. But today, we are reading specifically, beginning in the 4th chapter at verse 13, and reading into the 5th chapter at verse 10. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is being wasted away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but what it cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. If indeed, when we have taken it off, we will not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan under our burden, because we wish not to be unclothed, but to be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So, we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yet we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done to the body, whether good or evil. When I was in high school, I went regularly to a barber shop in my hometown, the Vaughn Brothers Barber Shop, and I remember that they had a plaque on their wall, rather large plaque, uh, made of wood with, with bright yellow letters on it, and it said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, quoting from Hebrews 13, 8. St. Paul reminds the Corinthians that our present life is transient, but the future is permanent and unchanging. He furthers the comparison by using the image of a tent and a house. The tent in which we now live, a tent is something temporary, something not meant in most cases to be permanent. Certainly, when, uh, when the, the ancestors uh, of the Jewish people were a wandering people, uh, a tribe, looking after sheep and whatever, they were living in tents, just in the same way that some Bedouin communities continue that same lifestyle in the Holy Land to today. But they were becoming a more organized people. They were living in cities. Paul was probably in Ephesus and was writing to the Christians in Corinth, a, a major trading port uh, in Greece, uh, on the Isthmus, uh, the Aegean Sea. Uh, and these were urban people. So they understood that image of living in tents. Now, we sometimes go camping and living in tents, but we realize that that's temporary. And after a few weeks camping, it's nice to get home to a real bed in a real house, especially if we've just been sleeping on a, on a sleeping bag on a tent floor. 
uh, you know, they've got some pads and whatever. We used air mattresses, but it seemed as if my, my sleeping bag was always slipping off the air mattress in the middle of the night. You may have had that experience also. And Paul said, this is a tent, it's temporary, but we will be living in a house in the future, in the heavenly kingdom, a house not made with human hands, but made with divine hands. And so we have this inner longing to be back home with God. Uh, when we think of ourselves as dwelling only temporarily here on earth. Uh, think of how change, how things change in our life. If I go back to my hometown, there's so many changes. Uh, they put new roads through where there didn't used to be roads. They've torn down some buildings, they've built others. Things have changed a lot since I left there uh, 55, 60 years ago. You, uh, you know what it's like if you've ever moved. And even if you've lived in the same town all your life, you know the changes that have taken place. We've been in London now almost 22 years. And things have changed a lot around us in that time. Uh, new buildings have gone up. New restaurants. Old ones have closed. New buildings everywhere. Housing developments here, there, and everywhere. But it's all temporary. If you have traveled and visited the remains of former civilizations, where archaeological digs have taken place, you see it did not last. It's gone. It's changed. But Paul does not write in despair of these things. He writes in hope. His hope for the life after death. And he is reassuring the Christians in Corinth, still a comparatively small community, but he says our community of faith is continuing to grow. And it will be better and better. This wonderful opportunity. And so as we work our way through Second Corinthians and We'll be looking at it again next week. Uh, we, we see uh, Paul's concern for these people and Paul's constant sense of the life that is to come and how we can eagerly anticipate that life. These are words of joy and happiness, and I hope you are enjoying sharing them with me. Let's take a few minutes now to look back in history to see what's taken place on this 29th of May and how we can learn and, and grow from it. On this day in 1886, Atlanta physician and pharmacist John Pemberton began to advertise Coca-Cola. He had suffered a saber wound in the Civil War and he was looking for something that would give relief. Uh, and people were using alcoholic beverages and mixing medications with alcohol and were kind of living their life in a haze. And so he mixed up this concoction, including carbonated water and some sweetness to it, uh, and found that it gave great relief and began to advertise it for curing all sorts of ills. Ah, in the music world, on this date, in uh, the 29th of May, 1913, Igor Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring premiered at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées in Paris, France. And in 1914, one of those tragedies that we bring to mind on the 29th of May, the Norwegian coal carrier vessel Storstad rammed into the Canadian ship the Empress of Ireland uh, at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. 1,024 people died, making it the worst peacetime merit marine disaster uh, in Canadian waters in Canadian history. Um, we pray for the repose of, of those who died that day and we pray for all who sail the seas. It's, uh, it can be dangerous and we pray God will protect them in those times. Former President John F. Kennedy was born on this date, the 29th of May 1917 in Brookline, Massachusetts. He was, of course, assassinated on the 22nd of November, 1963, at the young age of 46, and always in our memories, he will be a young man, even though he was born 
104 years ago. Always in our memories, we think of how he brought us such things as the Peace Corps, how he uh, worked to establish a civil rights law. We we think of uh, his, his statement, ask not what you can do for your country, but what, what your country can do for you, but rather what you can do for your country. And we, uh, we're thankful for his leadership. We might wish his term could have been longer, but thankful for the way that he inspired so many people in so many countries to look for the best in themselves and to bring out the best in their nations and lands. A birth of note, on the 29th of May, 1927, pharmacist and entrepreneur Jean Couteau was born in Montreal. A large drugstore chain bears his name. And so if you're traveling mainly in Quebec and see Jean Couteau Pharmacy, you'll know that it's really named after such a person. On this day, the 29th of May, 1939, Lionsgate Bridge officially opened, spanning the Burrard Inlet and connecting Stanley Park and Vancouver City Center to the North Shore. We can be thankful for those engineers and those builders who construct bridges and tunnels and highways and means of getting uh, together. Uh, and thankful for those opportunities we therefore have to go from place to place. And from the music world, a bit of delightfulness. In 1942, on this date, Bing Crosby recorded White Christmas, the world's best-selling single uh, record, estimated that 100 million copies were sold. And amazingly, he recorded the whole thing in just 18 minutes. Some recordings, I understand, take a whole day in the recording studio. 18 minutes. The song then appeared later in 1942 in the movie Holiday Inn uh, and received the Academy Award in 1942 for Best Song. And so here, with summer night not quite beginning, we can think of our dreams of White Christmas, our many wonderful memories of winter seasons, and how that uh, snow gives that special meaning to Christmas. Although it's by my experience that most of the parishes I have served depend upon the Christmas offering for a significant chunk of the annual income. And we clergy have been known to quietly pray that if we have a white Christmas, it doesn't all come in a blizzard on Christmas Eve and keep everybody home from church. Uh, just a little insight into how the mind of the faithful clergy person works from time to time. In a death of note, uh, Canadian screen star Mary Pickford, birth name was Gladys Marie Smith, died on this date in 1979 at the age of 87. In 1916, Mary Pickford was the first female film star to get a million dollar contract. She earned for herself the nickname queen of the movies. Uh, primarily silent film, but remembered and loved by so many for so many years. And so we do give thanks for the life and the acting talents of Mary Pickford. And thanks for the many movies that have brought joy, learning, inspiration, challenge, and whatever else to our lives. And with that as background, let us now turn again to our prayers. And we use for the last time the prayer for Pentecost. Almighty and ever living God, who fulfilled the promise of Easter by sending your Holy Spirit and opening to every race and nation the way to life eternal, keep us in the unity of your Spirit, that every tongue may tell of your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we pray for the evening. Most holy God, the source of all good desires, all right judgments, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, 
so that our minds may be fixed on doing your will, and that free from the fear of our enemies, we may pass our time in rest and quietness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Creator of the universe, watch over us and keep us in the light of your presence. May our praise continually blend with that of all creation until we come together to the eternal joys which you promise in your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we pause for a moment of silence in which we can bring the special intentions of our hearts and minds to this time of prayer. And now, as our Savior Jesus Christ has taught us, and each praying in the language of our choice, we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you and those you love and those that you pray for today and always. Amen. This service of evening prayer has come to you as a ministry of the Church of the Ascension in London, Ontario, Canada. Tomorrow we will have online worship through YouTube at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern Daylight Time in, uh, in, the, Northern, in, the, uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, you are welcome if you wish to join in that time. I encourage you to look online or in person as you may be permitted for worship tomorrow. It is the Lord's Day. It's a wonderful day to give thanks to God. And I hope we'll be able to join together again tomorrow evening for these times of prayer. Tomorrow again will be the Festival of the Holy Trinity. A beautiful, beautiful day in the church calendar. Now, my friends, go in peace. May the God of peace go with you. Amen.